people of the multiverse today i would like to or tonight i should say is just share with you a video it's incredible it's it's a video of one of the greatest british heroes that nobody has ever heard about and it's about a bloke called morris wilson now morris wilson fought in the first world war and when he came home he lived a fabulous life for a few years. He lived in Australia, America, New Zealand, places like that, made a bit of money. But then, after seeing a photograph or a video, or re reading about, wasn't even a video, but reading about uh, George Mallory and Sandy Irvin attempt on, on Everest, he was inspired and decided to be the first person to climb Everest. And what he did, his, his idea was to buy an aeroplane I couldn't fly, fly to Everest, crash land on the slopes of Everest, and then climb to the top. He'd never climbed a mountain. He'd never even been to, I don't think he'd even been to Wales. He nearly made it. It is the most incredible story ever. The phrase daring do could have been invented for Maurice Wilson. Got a gin and tonic. So with no further ado, let's get into it. I will try not to interrupt too much. It's just too good a yarn. The year was 1933 and Maurice Wilson was a man with a mission. Believing that he had a duty to impart to humanity his message of physical healing through spiritual meditation and fasting, he needed a grand gesture to prove himself to the public, and he thought he knew just the thing that would bring him onto the world stage. He was going to be the first person to climb Everest, the world's highest mountain. Determined, resourceful and driven, this was a man who would not be stopped. But what happens when inspiration turns into obsession? and a man who won't give up meets an obstacle that he can't overcome. Born in 1898 in Bradford, England, Maurice Wilson was one of the generation of young men who were thrown into manhood in the baptism of fire that was the brutal warfare of World War I. He distinguished himself admirably, taking part in the Battle of Passchendaele and winning the Military Cross for Courage Under Fire. He was later wounded by machine gun fire and returned to Britain to convalesce, but his injuries left him with a stiff left arm and he was in constant low-grade pain. Having survived the horrors of the battlefields of France, Wilson dedicated the following decade to travel and he lived variously in New Zealand, South Africa, Europe and then America. He was married twice, but neither marriage lasted and it seemed that his life was somewhat aimless and he filled the time by... He was basically, he was a dreamer, wasn't he? He was, uh, people have said in the past that his attempt to do this was brought on by post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't really agree, and you know? I've kind of looked into the life of Maurice Wilson quite a bit, and I just think he was a beautiful, beautiful dreamer. It's just, I, I watched this and it's just, it's just fabulous. What a fabulous man. Dabbling in Buddhism and various forms of Eastern philosophy and medicine. By 1932, he was on the boat back to England, suffering a serious bout of pulmonary tuberculosis, which, back in those days, was often fatal. Seemingly at his wit's end, Wilson found a spiritual healer in, of all places, the posh neighbourhood of Mayfair in London, 
undergoing a strict regimen of prayer and fasting for 32 days, Maurice Wilson found himself unexpectedly cured of all his ailments, and for him, this was like being born again. It seemed to him that he had discovered a great secret, and in doing so, he also found his purpose in life. When Wilson chanced upon a newspaper article about the failed 1924 expedition to Mount Everest. Now I've got to say something about this because the two people at the back on the left hand side, the first one on the left with the hat on is Sandy Irving. The one next to him is the great George Mallory. My boyhood and manhood hero. Uh, now they made an attempt on Everest in 1924 and it's too long to go into it now and I've kind of agonised over the years about whether they actually made it. At first I was absolutely convinced they did, uh, now the, but because of the timing and certain things like um, they found George Mallory, his body recently after 75 years. Um, his, like his goggles were in his pocket and his camera was missing. Now they think Sandy Irving may have had his camera and taken photographs of him on the summit and then they never found Irving, He's, he died, at, we, they don't know, they never found him. <coughs> and like his, his goggles were in his pocket, which means that they must have been coming down as the sun went down or in, uh, at night, which kind of gives them time to get up to the top and back. They were seen by Noel Odell, uh, where he said they were on the second step uh, near the summit of Everest. Then later on, under kind of duress, he said, well, it might have been the first step and everything, but whatever. These guys are fabulous. Fabulous. I mean, I just love them. They were, they were amazing, amazing people. It hit him like a bolt of lightning. He would show the world the power of prayer and fasting, and he would do this by being the first man to climb Mount Everest. And he would do it alone. To set the scene, it's worth recounting a bit of background about Mount Everest and the public interest in the mountain during the 1930s. Everest had first been identified as the world's highest mountain back in the 1850s, during the enormous project undertaken by the British to survey the entire Indian subcontinent. Ever since Everest had been named as the world's highest peak, the race had been on to climb it, but political upheavals and rivalries between Nepal and Tibet had kept Everest off limits to foreigners for decades. However, during the 1920s, there had been three expeditions to climb the mountain, but all ended in failure and the 1924 expedition had resulted in the deaths of the legendary British climbers Mallory and Irvine. They were last seen heading strongly for the summit, but the clouds rolled in and they were never seen alive again. The conquest of Everest remained fixed in the minds of the general public as a tantalising prize, but a prize seemingly beyond the abilities of normal men. The scheme that Wilson came up with to conquer Everest was like something straight out of a boy's own adventure magazine. He was going to buy a plane, fly halfway around the world, crash land on the lower slopes of Mount Everest, and then climb out to the summit and plant his flag. The fact that Wilson had never flown a plane, or climbed a mountain, was of no consequence. Fasting and prayer and his indomitable will would seem to the top. Of this he was convinced. He bought a second-hand gypsy moth biplane, which he christened Everest, and began preparations for his trip to the summit of Everest. Flying lessons were duly undertaken, and although by no means a natural, Wilson did master the basics of flying, albeit with a few minor hiccups along the way. As to mountaineering, well, how hard could it be? Wilson rectified his lack of mountaineering experience by spending a few weeks hiking around Snowdonia National Park in Wales, and then followed this with a quick trip to the Lake District. To build up his stamina for the climb, he walked from London to Bradford and back, a trip of Nick didn't want the prize of Everest going to some individual. Now that's a feat in itself, I mean, you, you, if, if nothing else, you've got to give him credit for that. 
30 kilometres. Having contacted the daily newspapers in order to whip up publicity for the mission, Wilson had become a kind of eccentric underdog that the British public were warming to. With his never-say-die attitude and... Just one thing I've got to say, I don't want to pause it too much, but the lad who is narrating this is obviously from Yorkshire, because if you listen to him, instead of saying to, he says to, and that's very, very Yorkshire. Nobody else does that. Uncompromising nature, he was winning the hearts and minds of the average citizen. However, the stuffy, upper-class members of the Royal Alpine Club were not so enamoured with him. They didn't want the prize of Everest going to some individual climber who horror of horrors wasn't even a member of their exclusive club and so some strings were pulled and the British Air Ministry promptly issued an order forbidding Wilson to fly. However in true Wilson's style he just ignored this and set off anyway embarking on his 5,000 mile trip on the 21st of May 1933. These were the years of aviation pioneers like Lindbergh and Erhardt pushing the boundaries of global aviation and so the public eagerly awaited news of Wilson's madcap flight to the Himalayas, the roof of the world. Incredibly, he made it. Flying in stages of 620 miles, which was the limit of his fuel tanks, Wilson flew through Europe, across the Mediterranean, over... There's a book called The Moth and the Mountain. I can't remember its book, but, but it's worth reading. I've got a copy. Um, and, and, and it tells you about his flights. It's about, I think his, his, his fuel tanks had a limit to about 625 miles, something like that. And he hopped all the way over there. And he was like, all the way, people were trying to stop him. Governments were trying to stop him. They were sending him back. And he'd like fly out to the airport and then supposed to turn left back towards England. And he wouldn't. He'd just turn right. And they're all going crackers about this. And he just... This is amazing. This is just amazing. Over the barren lands of North Africa, into Egypt, and on across the Middle East. Flying in blistering heat over unpopulated deserts, with at times just a child's atlas and a rough map scrawled on the back of his hand for navigation, he should never have made it. And yet somehow he managed to arrive at the next refuelling point, often with his plane literally running on fumes. Ignoring the constant orders from the Air Ministry to turn around and fly home, he pushed on, finally arriving in Karachi two weeks after leaving London. It was an incredible feat for a man who set off with practically no flying experience and who had been provided with no assistance at all from the authorities. By now, the Nepalese authorities had gotten wind of Wilson's intentions and had firmly blocked any onward travel. Without any possibility of getting into Nepal and with the aircraft now impounded, Wilson had no choice but to halt and rethink his plan of attack. Onward air travel was impossible, so he sold the plane and they headed overland, east to Darjeeling to lay low for the winter. He had decided that he would secretly enter Tibet and approach Everest from the north in the spring of 1934. Whilst in Darjeeling, he managed to recruit three Nepali Sherpas who had been on the previous 1924 expedition. And he was confident that with the aid of these experienced porter climbers, he would reach Everest to begin his solo ascent of the summit. On the 24th of March, 1934, Wilson and the three Sherpas set off. As travel through Tibet was also restricted, they were all disguised as Buddhist monks on pilgrimage. Wilson, with no knowledge of the language, pretended to be a deaf mute as so to allay any suspicion. Camping in remote valleys and avoiding the local villagers, it took three weeks of trekking through steamy jungles and the wind-swept ice. He was actually dressed as a monk in all the clothes. He put stuff on his face to look it look, make it look darker. But the one thing he'd got, he'd got a pair of obnailed boots on. They were stopped by the police once or twice, but it, it, it got away with it. It's almost like some kind of soap, television soap comedy thing. He planes to arrive at the Wrong Book Monastery, the closest inhabited spot to Everest, and a kind of informal base camp for any expeditions to the mountain. <laughs> 
having spent two days fasting and praying at the monastery, Wilson set off alone on his historic summit attempt. His clothing and provisions were adequate, he was following an established route, it was the right time of year for climbing Everest, and he was fit and determined. The two things that were missing were any decent gear for ice climbing and any kind of technical climbing experience on this kind of mountain. Wilson's plan for tackling the mountain was perfectly sound, insomuch as one lone inexperienced man's attempt to climb the mountain could be said to be in any way a good idea. He would follow in the footsteps of Hugh Rutledge's 1933 expedition and head up the East Rongbuk Valley, traverse the glacier, climb the ice walls up onto the North Col and from here get onto the northeast ridge. Once on the ridge, he could simply follow it up to the summit and plant his flag. Well, that was the idea anyway. Wilson's problems began on the approach to the mountain itself as he ascended the East Rongbuk Glacier, the gigantic river of ice which dominates the East Rongbuk Valley and is the gateway to the lower slopes of Mount Everest. Forced to twist and turn amongst the great icy pinnacles, the massive blocks of towering ice and the deep crevasses of the glacier, Wilson got hopelessly lost and struggled around here for days, saying in his own words, I floundered about, doing 50 times more work than was necessary. As the weather deteriorated, he began to go snow blind, and he was stuck in his tent at about 21,500 feet, becoming weaker by the day. Days later, when the weather finally broke, he wisely retreated, descending over 5,000 foot in one day, scrambling down the glacier in an almost panicked state. By the time he reached the monastery, he was half blinded with swollen eyes, dehydrated, he had a twisted ankle, a fractured rib, and his old war wound was plaguing him terribly. In short, he was a complete mess. It took 18 days of recuperation at the monastery for Wilson to recover his strength, whereupon he declared that he was ready for another crack at the mountain. The Sherpas couldn't believe it. They had assumed that Wilson would be heading home after his first taste of climbing Everest, but oh no, Wilson was just getting started. On May 12th, Wilson set off again, accompanied by the Sherpas. This time, they made much better progress, traversing the Rongbuk Glacier in just three days and arriving at Rutledge's Camp 3. Here, they found a veritable bounty of abandoned food and equipment. Wilson's fasting regime promptly went out the window while he stuffed down on leftover biscuits, butter, jams and chocolates. He also found a pair of ice crampons which had been left behind, but he later discarded them, a mistake which illustrated his lack of experience. Wilson was hoping to find traces of the route used by the previous year's expedition, even spending time looking for fixed ropes and steps cut into the ice to help him get up onto the top of the North Col. He found none, but resolved to climb to the Col anyway. Wilson set off alone to climb the slopes above Camp 3, but he soon found his way blocked by an immense wall of ice 40 feet high. Time and time again, Wilson threw himself at this obstacle, but without the proper gear and the technical know-how, he was doomed to failure. No he was never going to do it, was he? I mean, it's just such a sad shame, but he was never going to do it. He says over and over again, he threw himself at the ice wall. He had no crampons. He hadn't got the technique to... Oh, by the way... Um, I've got crampons and ice axes and loads of uh, winter climbing gear and tents and sleeping bags, all for completely mad sub-zero temperatures. I won't be using them again. Anybody who wants to buy them, get in touch with me. Um, but this this single one ice wall was basically the thing that thwarted him. I believe that if he could have got past this obstacle... He could have made it. There were only one more obstacle after this. That I think there was a second step. If he got there, he, he would have made it. 
So sad. So how hard he tried or how much he prayed, he could not get up the ice wall. His strength began to fail him and he was wearing himself down, trying again and again to beat the wall of ice. Having spent four days trying and failing, he returned to Camp 3. The relief that the Sherpas felt when seeing the return of the half-dead and totally exhausted Wilson quickly turned to dismay when it became clear that he wasn't about to give up. Wilson spent the next two days in his tent, in bed, at Camp 3, his mind wandering, plagued by constant headaches, and by now almost delirious. He began to feel as if somebody was with him, the strange, invisible companion of which many mountaineers have spoke. Very common, there's laws. Most people who attempt Everest or high mountains, um, it could be lack of oxygen um, that causes this, but most people say that they feel that there is someone there with them. You know, some people put it down to the, the ghosts of the mountain, people who died on the mountain, but it's very common. And this is what oxygen, probably what oxygen deprivation does. It's strange, but I feel that there is somebody with me in the tent all the time. The Sherpas refused to accompany Wilson any further, knowing full well that only death awaited them if they continued to climb. They pleaded with Wilson to return with them, but he, of course, refused. He told the Sherpas to wait at Camp 3 for him for 10 days, and then to go back down if he hadn't returned by then. On May 29th, he set off alone for the final time. His final diary entry reads, Off again, gorgeous day and he was never seen alive again. The following year, Charles Warren, a member of the 1935 expedition, came across Wilson's body high up on the East Rongbuk Glacier. Wearing a brown pullover and grey flannel trousers, Wilson was sitting upright in the ice, his body seemingly frozen in the process of putting his boots on. Having recovered Wilson's personal effects, including his diary, the expedition members wrapped the body in the remains of Wilson's tattered tent and buried him in a deep crevasse. The recovered diary gave insight into Wilson's final days, the trial at the ice wall, his gradual mental disintegration, and his determination to keep pushing on in the face of an impossible challenge. It's hard to put your finger on exactly why Wilson kept going, refusing to come down, even when he knew he was doomed. Some have suggested post-traumatic stress disorder from his World War I experiences. Others think that possibly he'd entered a state of delirium, having been up there so long, and maybe he just sat there happily in the ice, his mind finally free of his freezing body. As for my own thoughts, on the one hand I find Wilson to be an inspirational character. His refusal to give up at the first sign of trouble, a healthy disdain for rigid authority, and his passion and drive are admirable. His flight from England to Asia was an incredible feat of nerve and navigation, and his trek from Darjeeling to Rongbuk was much faster than any of the previous expeditions, and he did get halfway up Everest, all on his own. On the other hand, he was a tragically flawed man. Wilson was doomed from the moment he set foot on the mountain. Everything he was and believed in now depended on him making it to the top. His beliefs in fasting and prayer would count for nothing if he didn't make it to the summit. For him, it really was a case of do or die. And sadly, there was no way he could accomplish what he'd set out to prove. Ironically, the drive perseverance and determination which helped him achieve so much ultimately ended up being the traits which led to his demise on the icy slopes of the North Col. On a final macabre note, the body of Morris Wilson is regularly returned to the surface of the East Rongbuk Glacier as it moves slowly down the valley, last appearing in 1989. His bones and tattered clothes, a grim reminder that sometimes all the willpower in the world is not enough 
if the task before you is literally impossible. And there you go. An absolutely fascinating tale and true. And I think that that's what it is, isn't it? It's like anybody can tell a story, but when it's true, it can be quite staggering, and I think that is quite staggering. It's inspirational, and it's just like, why has nobody heard of Maurice Wilson? Well, you have, no. Great book, The, Myth and the Moth and the Mountain. Great book. Um, I wrote a little bit of music. I record a little bit of music called The Moth and Maurice Wilson. <clears throat> I may have put it on at the beginning of this video. I may not. Anyway, peeps. That's me done. See you next time. Subscribe, like, do whatever. Peace and love.